Good morning, everybody. And, uh, plenty of seats, so if you're uh, entering now from that delicious practice, or some of the uh, friends that have been around the building, find a uh, find a comfortable chair. Welcome to our uh, symposium on force diplomacy in the American foreign policy. I'm Adam Abram, a member of the Board of And I'm going to be uh, moderating uh, this event for the first time. Our topic, I don't think, that, uh, I don't think it's the chosen and more important topic or a uh, more important yes, topic to discuss the topic before us today. America and the world are big players. We are undoubtedly the greatest military power But we and other substantial powers, of course, are facing serious and frightening challenges from emerging powers and uh, from relatively powerless but tactically clever and very powerful terrorist groups. And these challenges to us occur in the context of a world where trade patterns and our community patterns are changing very rapidly, and where new powerful economies are emerging. Now, this change, this highly competitive environment, is obviously stimulating both a lot of friction uh, between countries and the opportunity for new collaboration and cooperation. Who can the uh, San Francisco have a vision to put our knowledge at the service of society. And each of our distinguished panelists this morning is recognized as a leading scholar of the field, and all of them are actively engaged in shaping American foreign policy in response to the challenges and opportunities we face today. Uh, Anne Marie Slaughter is the dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton. She is widely acclaimed uh, for adding luster to that uh, distinguished. She's professor, she was a professor, professor of international law at Harvard. She is an expert also in international relations. And she is the convener and co-chair of the Princeton Project for National Security, which is a bipartisan, multi-year research project that created and formulated a bipartisan national security strategy for the United States. Colonel Scott Silman uh, served our country for 25 years as a military Proving that he has diplomatic skills that are at least visible in his progress as a lawyer. He holds appointments at both UNC and Duke Law School for the delight of us. Professor Sullivan is the executive director of the Center of Law, Ethics, and National Security. He and his center are at the center of discussions taking place right now regarding how U.S. forces will regulate themselves in the fight against terrorism. And, uh, Scott mentioned to me that this morning uh, his uh, center is convened in Washington uh, discussing just this subject and uh, with very distinguished and top level national security experts and military experts. And so Scott, thank you for joining us here today. And I know that uh, uh, yesterday and today we have a lot going on. Now Bruce Gentleson is uh, an experienced and uh, nuanced practitioner and scholar in the area of uh, international relations and politics. Bruce is so well known to this group as we almost need uh, no introduction, but I think his accomplishments uh, do bear some comfort nonetheless. Uh, during his recently completed five year stint as our director at the Stanford Institute, <laughs> We have become a far more international school. We've added a PhD program. We've expanded our program, our master's uh, program. We are on the verge, I believe, of creating the School of Public Policy, which he began pushing us for early uh, in this day. Bruce is the author of many books, including uh, the book that I've read most carefully and with great joy, uh, 
opportunities missed, opportunities seized, relentless diplomacy in the post Cold War world. He is actively involved in several bipartisan efforts to shape U.S. foreign policy in the 21st century and was a senior advisor to both the war and the Terry Cannon foreign policy. We're going to uh, have 15 minute presentations from each of our speakers uh, this morning and then followed by uh, questions uh, from the audience. And with that, uh, Dean Swarner, I ask you to lead us off this morning. Thank you very much. really through the end of the Cold War, 
state security and human security were the same thing. In other words, if you were a citizen of a state and you then put your hope for your own security, you trusted the state to protect you. This is, this is the foundation of the modern state system where we as individuals look to our government to provide domestic security and internationally what we want is to avoid some other government from taking, conquering our state. That's state security. So why now are we talking about human security? First of all, human security means the security of individuals from violence most notably, and that is the basis of the social contract. So from violent death, but also from death by disease, or by hunger, uh, or by essentially the anarchy of a collapsed state. So human security essentially means the protection of individuals worldwide, again, from violence, disease, poverty, or anarchy. Now why is that the business of the United Nations? Why should we be talking about human security in New York rather than in national capitals worldwide? The international system, as I said, is predicated on the idea that it's the domestic governments that are in charge of human security for their citizens and organizations like the United Nations that are responsible for protecting state security. And the answer is not hard to find. Uh, look at the events of the 1990s, and you will see that most of the crises in the world, ethnic conflict most notably, but also uh, genocide in Rwanda, the collapse of a state in Somalia, these were crises that happened with instincts in which individuals were threatened either directly by their own government, ethnic cleansing uh, in the former Yugoslavia, uh, or in Rwanda, genocide by members uh, of the, the Rwandan home government, or more generally, by the collapse of a government uh, in, in which there was no one to protect individuals from uh, violence or, again, uh, disease or poverty or anarchy. So the notion that human security is something that the international community has to care about is in part a function of the changing location of threats. I want to suggest, particularly to the younger members of the audience, that it's also the function of an internet age. It's the function of a world in which we no longer think of states as these opaque entities that you can locate on a map but that are represented only by their governments. We now have access to individuals around the world, direct access uh, to the internet and indirect access to the media. And we are much more aware of what is happening to human beings half the world away. And the question posed by those human beings is, if I'm about to lose my life from ethnic violence or simply uh, civil violence generally, uh, or from an epidemic, or from the collapse of my government, don't I deserve protection in the same way uh, that I would protect me if another government were going to invade? It's one pillar of the shift to human security. The second is the nature of the United Nations itself in which you have 191 nations. The vast majority of those nations are far more concerned about their basic domestic conditions, about development, but I mean the basics of development, the provision of essential health care, essential opportunities for the measure of economic prosperity, or at the very least, the ability to provide a better life for your children. When you talk about security in the halls of the United Nations, what you hear from the majority of those members is we are not worried about being invaded by another state. We are not worried about terrorism. We are worried about the fact that millions of our people are dying from AIDS or poverty, uh, and, and I mean extreme poverty, hunger, 
uh, or, as I said, civil and collapse states. So when you talk about security in the United Nations today, you hear two different sets of arguments. You hear developed countries like the United States, many European countries, saying we're still very concerned about threats to our integrity, about the kind of attack that we saw on 9-11 that could have, in fact, decapitated the United States if all those, those uh, attacks had been successful. Uh, they would have um, essentially taken out a different wing of the Pentagon, and thus our, our military defense was a, a planned attack on the Capitol, and of course in New York. We developed countries are worried about that kind of terrorism, and of course we're worried about the intersection of proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism, which again would annihilate a whole state. But we're still very worried about state security. Your other nations say, that's fine, we understand those are your concerns, Ours are equally important in terms of the lives of our people, but they are much more to do with the conditions at home and the, the response to them uh, in development uh, and a, a global uh, focus on issues like AIDS or the possi a possible third flu pandemic, uh, education and basic uh, development goals, economic goals. So we now have a United Nations that recognizes both state security and human security. If you look at the documents that were recently passed, uh, fall far short of uh, the Secretary General's goals for UN reform and the need of, of the US goals and the goals of many other nations. But what has emerged is a recognition of both kinds of security. State security remains important, but human security is at least officially, with an equal recognition. So what does that mean for the use of force? That's our topic today. If we are in an organization and in a world in which we define security much more broadly, how do we think about regulating the use of force? But I would suggest, equally important, how do we think about the kind of force that is needed? So let me talk about some of the implications for the use of force. The first point is that many of the issues raised by human security don't need force. If the question is, how do you uh, divide human beings halfway around the world with basic health care, access to education, access to the ability to earn a sufficient living to at least advance their children, uh, their children's lives, force doesn't really seem to be the answer. We need uh, new approaches uh, to development, and I, I think we need to move away from the aid versus trade debate. We need genuinely new approaches uh, to development. And indeed, if you look at what President, former President Clinton was doing at the UN Summit in September, that is he has the uh, Clinton Initiative that is focused exactly on working to improve the security of individuals worldwide, but not there's anything to do with force, to do with new approaches to development. Similarly, Senator Biden, in a speech that he gave in September, actually called for reforming the United Nations and turning it into an organization primarily focused on development. His proposal, his proposal by the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, national office was effectively human security issues are the most important issues that the UN can deal with. And we should simply recognize that the UN is not about trying to stop one nation from invading another, but it should be like the World Bank or the IMF. It should be an organization that is wholly dedicated to human security, to new approaches to development, to, to as I said, addressing fundamental issues of poverty and disease and access to education worldwide. Interesting. Uh, at a time when uh, we are talking about human reform. So the, the, I think if you, one way of thinking about this is that if we really took human security seriously, we might recognize there's a whole host of problems for which we simply shouldn't even be thinking about regulating the use of force. And we should be putting much more emphasis on those organizations, possibly including the reform 
them that focus on development issues. Very different from the way most of us think about security issues. Second implication is to the extent we do need force, we need a very different kind of force. The kind of force that we need to address human security issues is not the grand coalition of nations assembled to take on a government. Think about the Gulf War, which is one of the cases, the first Gulf War, uh, one of the cases where the UN really worked on the plan to work, in which Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait with the United States and other nations, go to the United States Nations Security Council, they say there's been a violation of international law, we need to respond, massing armies and essentially going into Kuwait and then pushing back uh, into Iraq. That's the classic kind of use of force that the architects of the United Nations imagined uh, would result in the United Nations. But if we're thinking about human security, what we need are very different kinds of force. In the first place, we need rapid reaction forces. Stand by, not you go to the Security Council and you wait nine months uh, to actually get force in place, but forces that are ready to go in to a country like Sierra Leone, or like Rwanda, or possibly now in Darfur, uh, cases where you absolutely have to stop the violence before you can even think about providing uh, basic access to human security. Very different configuration of forces. Uh, you either need to look to regional organizations to have these forces on tap, or you need some kind of standby force that is available to the United Nations as a whole. Beyond that, you need much more policing kind of force. And this, of course, we see in Iraq today, uh, where in a state where the problem is trying to quell civil violence, <coughs> troops are not the answer. We need police forces uh, who are trained to deal with highly violent situations. So a di very different kind of force. And finally, if we're thinking about human security and state security, we need to think about how these two kinds of security coexist and what kinds of force you need for both. Because everything I've said about human security does not deny the fact that state security is still a very real problem. This is an and, not an or. As we heard at the outset, we're in a world where there are rising powers. Rising powers are traditionally uh, it present difficult uh, issues to be negotiated diplomatically as existing powers make room for rising powers. We may well face a uh, world in which we have a tremendous scramble for natural resources. If you look at the 19th century, the combination of rising powers and the scramble for natural resources was not a good recipe. And of course, we're in a world in which nuclear weapons are proliferating. We may not want it, but the fact is they are proliferating. Those are all issues that have to be dealt with in the traditional way, by some kind of collective security or by balance of power politics. The question that I would leave you with is if you accept, as I think we must, that the majority of the world's people see security in terms of human security, and that means protection on a domestic level, and advancement on a domestic level, and they look to the international community to help them. We're going to need new kinds of force and new rules to use those that force. As I said, rapid reaction forces, policing forces. At the same time, we still need to be able to marshal the international community uh, to prevent war from breaking out or responding to a use of force when it's happened. How we put those two together? Is it one organization, the United Nations, with both capacities? Is it two organizations where the United Nations becomes focused on human security issues and there's a new organization focused on traditional state security issues? Those are the issues we're going to have to answer uh, at least in the next decade, if not sooner. Thank you.
force in international relations is perhaps the most dynamic and powerful element of national, national power. And yet it's so difficult to regulate. But from the earliest times, there have been attempts to establish rules for the use of military force in international relations, it's what we call the use ad bellum. In modern times, there were two attempts right after World War I, the League of Nations being one, the kellogg briand Pact being the other. Both failed as evidenced by World War II. And that Dean Slaughter has already mentioned the United Nations Charter of, of 1945, and I would suggest that perhaps that's the, the latest iteration of the international community's attempt to regulate force. And if you look at it, remember she talked about Article 2-4, and I think most of us look at that as a general prohibition against the use of force, with but two exceptions. One being when the United Nations Security Council actually authorizes the use of force, acting under Chapter 7 as it did to Al Saddam Hussein from Kuwait in 1991, when I was still wearing the uniform. And secondly, under Article 51, where a state may act in either individual or collective self-defense, but only after an armed attack. That's exactly what the charge says. Now, if a state does not have the United Nations Security Council authorization, then it tries to claim that it's acting in self-defense, because otherwise, if it is not covered under either component of the charter, it would be guilty of an unlawful act of aggression. So we see that states, since the charter, will work very hard to pose their use of force in terms of self-defense. When the United States invaded or bombed Tripoli after going after Gaddafi in 1986, we lodged the claim of self-defense. When we sent cruise missiles into Afghanistan, the Al-Qaeda training camps, when we took out the pharmaceutical plant in Sudan, we were acting in self-defense, we said. But although we made the same claim of the use of force and self-defense in both Granada in 1983 and in Panama in 1989, there was perhaps another purpose that was buried beneath the claim, and that was to ensure that there was a democratic regime in the state of both those countries. But if the line between the permissible and the impermissible use of military force is becoming more and more blurred since 1945, then one instance perhaps presents the most perplexing problem for us, and it's the 1999 use of force by NATO in Kosovo. You see, because it that use of force by NATO, the first time NATO had ever used military force since its origins, was not sanctioned by the United Nations Security Council, nor could we say that any member state of NATO had been invaded. At best, we could say that the flow of refugees into Macedonia created political instability, but that's not, that's not an army attack. Well, but if you asked whether the international community should allow Milosevic to continue his pattern of ethnic cleansing and Balkan to would all say no. So, NATO acted. Milosevic was stopped and is now before the tribunal at The Hague. And international lawyers would have said that was an illegal use of force. But nonetheless, it was appropriate. And that's what the Goldstone Commission did. Now, the problem is, what kind of a precedent does that mean? Can any organization use force when it believes it's appropriate, even though it may not be legal? Now, this brings us to the invasion of 2003 Iraq, something that's been all the years very much talking about. The coalition of the willing and the particular problems involved in the use of force in that instance. I'm sure all of you remember on the 5th of February, 2003, Colin Powell, who will be joining us this afternoon, went before the United Nations Security Council to try to get a resolution authorizing the use of force just as it had gone the same way in 1990 when the Security Council authorized it. And his goal was to get nine votes of the 15 and not have a veto. And his argument was twofold. 
First of all, he said that Iraq was in continuing material breach of its obligations on their prior Security Council resolutions, notably 687 and 1441, and that Saddam Hussein had an affirmative obligation to cooperate with the weapons inspectors and to make full disclosure, and they had not. But there was a second prong of this argument. And the second prong was that the weapons of mass destruction did exist in Iraq, and further, and perhaps more importantly, there was a direct linkage between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda. The significance of the second prong of his argument he is that it laid the stage for the use of force under a doctrine called preemption, a principle of customary international law. But let me explain. When the vast majority of nations act in a certain pattern in international relations because they feel under a, a legal obligation to do so, what we call state practice plus opinio juris, then if carried out by a number of states over time, grudgingly slow normally, that becomes what we call customary international law. And in customary international law, there is a principle of self-defense that perhaps runs parallel to or in addition to the United Nations Charter provision. And interestingly, as you recall, under the Charter, you can only use self-defense after an armed attack. Now, that requirement does not exist in customary international law. And the principle itself flows from a case that is well known to many students, it's the Caroline case of 1837. Let me just share a little bit about that with you. During the Mackenzie Rebellion in Upper Canada in 1837, the insurgents took over an island, the Navy Island, which is in the Niagara River between what was then and is now the Canadian side and the American side. American sympathizers who originally started out in Buffalo used a very small privately owned steamboat called the Caroline to transfer munitions and foodstuffs to help those that were aiding in the revolt. The British boarded this steamboat in the middle of the night on the American side, killed two Americans, sent a boat to plane, and sent it over an iron fault. Now, that act by the British prompted a letter of protest from the Americans to the British minister, and, and I will collapse a, a number of years of correspondence, but ultimately, Daniel Webster, as our Secretary of State at the time, writing to Lord Ashburton, the British minister, basically said that you owe us reparations for the invasion of our sovereignty. And Lord Ashburton came back and he said, what we did in boarding the Carol on that night was an act of self-defense. And Webster writes back and he says, the only time that that would be an appropriate and authorized use of force would be if there was a necessity of self-defense. Instant, overwhelming, leaving no moment, no means of choice, no moment of deliberation. And that principle has generally been accepted as a part of the fabric of customary international law. And it, again, requires imminence, necessity, and proportionality, of general proportional use of force. Starting in early 2002, the Bush administration started to put forth a modification of this principle that has become known as anticipatory self-defense and argued that when you're dealing with weapons of mass destruction, that the incident of imminence must be collapsed, that a weapon of mass destruction, when put in a missile, can be targeted in the United States with a matter of minutes. This became also a part of the official text of our national security policy, and let me read it to you because it still exists. It's the September 2002 National Security Strategy of the United States, and it says this, the United States has long maintained the option of preemptive action to counter a sufficient threat to our national security. The greater the threat, the greater the risk of inaction, and the more compelling the case for taking anticipatory action to defend ourselves. And here's the important part. Even if uncertainty remains as to the time and the place of the attack, to forestall or prevent such hostile acts by our adversaries, the United States will, if necessary, act preemptively. 
now you see what was at the heart of Colin Powell's argument in the Security Council. Weapons of mass destruction, but standing alone, Saddam Hussein did not have the capability to transfer those weapons to the United States and to attack us. But when you couple it with the attack of 2001 by Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda does have the means to strike the United States. And those two factors taken together establish preemption. And preemption was very much a part of the United States' rationale for going to war in Iraq. Now, the problem, and there is a problem, is that preemption, if it continues to grow and become a firm part of the principles of international law, customary international law, it is not for us alone to use. You see, because if it is part of the international law, it is applicable to any nation state. Any state that perceives itself threatened can therefore act preemptively. Do you remember what Putin said after the attack on the school building in Bethlehem? He said, we reserve the right to strike preemptively at terrorists wherever they are in the world. Anyway, when the Secretary of State recently said, we are not taking the military option off the table with regard to Iran, the principle to be invoked, if it is invoked, would be preemption. The problem of this is that when you remove the United Nations Security Council and the UN Charter, and when you take them off the table as the arbiter of the use of military force and international relations, it becomes a very dangerous world in which to live. Thank you. Uh, but more fundamentally, I think, beyond our work, uh, 
it really is that these issues are both timeless uh, and timely. Uh, they're timeless in the sense that at any level of politics, questions about the legitimate use of force are really among the first principles at the foundations of political systems. So at the nation state level, we kind of know where to look. We look to constitutions for answers to these questions. But at the international level, there really is no comparable source of authority. Not the UN Charter, not the body of international, nothing fully comparable to the Constitution. So we ask questions about when and why is the use of force legitimate? Who makes these decisions? How is force to be used both effectively and ethically? Uh, and because the answers to these international level questions are much more indeterminate than their domestic level counterparts, uh, the first principles are much more contested. Uh, they're timely also, obviously, in the way, of course, Iraq, uh, but also, as, 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 as Dean Slaughter mentioned, Darfur, uh, and so many other issues in which the United States and the United Nations and others are faced with really tough choices about force and diplomacy. Which best serves international peace and security, justice, and humanitarianism? Where's the balance point? Who makes the decisions? How do we do it? And I think the emphasis you've heard from my colleagues as well is on the middle word, and that the easy debate is the one that gets framed as, you know, you either do force or diplomacy, as if it's always a dichotomy. There are situations, perhaps, in which it is, but more often, the dilemma is where is the balance point between the two, whether it's the threat of the use of force that can enhance diplomacy, or sometimes the threat of use of force can actually undermine. And I think all of us share this approach that the emphasis is on that middle word and. Um, so if we take some perspective, and. Uh, going last has either the problem or the benefit of so much that's already been said. But I think what we've tried to give you is this perspective really on the last 10 or 15 years of how these issues have cropped up. Because we found that the end of the Cold War, whatever else it meant, it did not mean the end of the war. Uh, and these questions about when and how and who decides have been with us time and again. And as both Scott and Anne Marie said, in some ways we actually started the post-Cold War year off with use this term carefully, the easy case, in some respects, of the Persian Gulf War. It was classic interstate aggression. Tanks rolled, internationally recognized borders were violated. One country invaded another. And we had the United States in the lead, uh, a coalition, a multilateral coalition that would have been impossible during the Cold War. Uh, the UN Security Council acted. Uh, the force that deployed was formidable. Uh, and the first principles were pretty clear when one nation invaded another. The ethnic and civil conflicts that raged for so much of the 90s were not so easy to say the least. Somalia and Bosnia and Rwanda and Kosovo uh, and many others. Um, and there's been plenty of controversy over who and what bore which and how much of the blame for these humanitarian horrors. But what, what, what blame there was, effective policy there was not. Uh, and again, as has been stressed, these issues involve more than just the use of force. The roots of conflict are in poverty, in inequality, ideology, environmental degradation, and other fundamental social, political, and economic conditions. And they also need to be addressed. And the full plenipotentiary of diplomacy, and conflict resolution, and state building, and other tools and strategies need to be tapped. They're less glamorous. You, have, you don't have as good food fights on them on, on, on talk shows on TV. But they're fundamentally part of the picture. But nevertheless, we could not get away from the question of, of should force be used. And so at the end of the 90s, there was beginning to be a very interesting debate going on uh, about this from a humanitarian perspective. The assumption had always been force is a bad thing. If you care about the values of the world, justice, you know, you're not intervention. People say, wait a second. That means it's fast. We kind of go in and pick up the pieces after the genocide and ethnic cleansing. Is that really the best we can do? You know, are there situations in which force, while it should never be a first resort, also should not be a last resort, maybe needs to be an early resort? And this got manifested in the concept of what was called the responsibility to protect, uh, which came up in a lot of writings well before, really, the Iraq controversy. And both Emory and I have written on this in some, in some length, and the idea was the international community may have a responsibility to protect people, not just when they're endangered by, by armies crossing borders, but when their own government is out to kill them in uh, And then, as Kofi Annan himself said, the UN Charter was made in the names of the peoples of the world, not just the states. 
Now, of course, it says, well, where do you draw the line? And it gets a lot of complicated questions. But what it did is it opened up this notion out of the sense of, you know, intervention was always the wrong option. And if you were a good person, you believed in non intervention. And it's been a real values wrestling match. This was all before 9 11. And it comes 9 11. Uh, and again, I think we had a situation in which the world acted together. Uh, in cities like London and Berlin and Amman and Beijing and Seoul, uh, even in France, as they said, uh, Le Mans declared, we are all Americans today. Uh, the UN acted decisively, and NATO, for the first time in its history, invoked its mutual defense clause, Article 5, which we had always thought the Europeans would invoke for us to come to their defense. But in fact, they, in various ways, came to our defense uh, in Article 5. Um, the sense of, uh, of, of redefinition by 9-11 by was there, but the problem was that all of these issues that were with us when we went to bed on the night of September 10th, you know, ethnic conflicts, uh, globalization, the human security issues that Anne Marie raised, you know, for understandable reasons, for a period after 9-11, we kind of like couldn't stop. We couldn't deal with them emotionally, psychologically. They didn't go away. And so the, the, the problem became, how do we deal both with the 9-11 agenda, very serious agenda, and also with this notion of the September 10th agenda that was still with us as we moved forward. I'm not going to say a lot about Iraq, uh, but clearly uh, it's been addressed, and we've no doubt we'll address it in the discussion part. Uh, let me simply say my view without putting too fine a point on it, is that Iraq is one of the biggest disasters in the history of America. Uh, in terms of what I'm saying, sort of, you know, tell them something to say what you mean. Sort of, uh, but then, as we try to sort out Iraq, the reason I'm not going to say a lot about it is that I think that when we think about this question of force and diplomacy, sometimes we think about it only through the lens of Iraq. And I think what we've been trying to say today is we can have our views on Iraq. But there are other issues which pose their own questions. And one might believe that the use of force in Iraq was a bad decision. Uh, but then you still have to think through these questions in the other, other areas of policy for these other problems that we have. Um, there may come a point where diplomacy in a classical sense is defined by um, Sir Harold Nicholson, a British diplomat, as the management of international relations by negotiation will fully suffice for international peace and national security and humanitarian justice. Uh, but we're not there yet. Indeed, we're much further from it than we thought amidst sort of the immediate euphoria of the immediate post-Cold War. On the other hand, we have seen the consequences of the Bush foreign policy revolution of what our colleagues, uh, Igor Dahlgren and Jim Lindsay, called an America on them <coughs> that would use its strength to change the status quo of the world. And so as we think about these issues, and we go forward, we see both the scope and the limits, the need and the risks of using force. Let me just also add to it three points, which are sort of, um, let's call it uh, two, maybe not three years for diplomacy. Because I think we sometimes underestimate what can be achieved through diplomacy. It's this long, slogging process uh, behind the scenes, you know, not very glamorous, hard to get your hands on. But let me address three aspects of it that I think are very important. Uh, have played a positive role already and continue to need to play a positive role. One is something that is students in my course know, uh, uh, written a lot about, which is the recent case of Libya. Now here we had the original road, Muammar Gaddafi himself, who actually was really the first on the list when we started talking about roads uh, and that sort of thing, who ended up uh, doing uh, uh, what, I, what I like to call the full month uh, he gave up all of his weapons of mass destruction. He got out of the business of terror. Uh, not become a democracy, not a full Monty in sort of a human, human rights sense, but in a strategic sense, major concessions were made uh, in December 2003. And it presents an interesting case, because on the one hand, it sort of happened in the context of Iraq, and Bush administration liked to see, see if you learn the lesson of Iraq. But if you actually look into the case and talk to the people that were involved on the British side, the American side, even to a certain extent I was able to do on the Libyan side, what it really is is also a very interesting story for the folks. That there were secret talks that had started back in the late Clinton administration. Uh, they got carried forward in the Bush administration. 
Without going into the details, it was one of those times where Secretary Powell and National Security Rice uh, managed to control the policy and keep certain people uh, out of it uh, until the very last minute. Uh, but there were some interesting lessons there. And one of the lessons was that you were able to get major policy change without regime change. That all through this process, the Gaddafi and his people needed to be reassured that if they made major concessions, it wouldn't be seen as a sign of weakness and you'll come get it. But there would be a sign of willing to negotiate and make deals. Uh, and so the notion sort of that, well, you got to keep this regime thing stick on the table because nobody would listen, actually could be counterproductive uh, in many of these cases. And, and, and we got very substantial policy change uh, without the neoconservative notion of the to change. Secondly, it was a case of the and, the force and diplomacy. The backdrop of force was there. Uh, even if you could say, well, Gaddafi should have known after Iraq went so bad, there was no chance that he would be attacked. You know, I think leaders who come to power through brutality never dismiss the possibility that it can be used. Uh, so that it wasn't not a fact. It was a fact. Uh, but it really was probably much more a story of successful diplomacy with a backdrop of force. Uh, and thirdly, it happened, and, and also part of that was the mix of, of, of carrots and sticks. Uh, the world had actually worked together on this. Going back to the early 1990s, the United Nations had imposed global sanctions on, on Libya. Uh, and that there was a sense that you couldn't split us and our allies. The British played an enormous important role. And so you sort of had a very interesting case here that frankly juxtaposed to Iraq, in which you got policy change without regime change. You had effective diplomacy with some backdrop of force. And the world hung together and you got results. Uh, there's a lot to be learned from that. It's not surgically transplantable to every other case. Uh, but nevertheless, there's some interesting lessons. Secondly, is what is often called preventive diplomacy. This was referred to a lot before, uh, particularly by Andrew. You know, if we always wait till the end to deal with these problems, you know, the options are fewer. It's, it's somewhat analogous to preventive medicine that in many of these instances, we had warnings. There were warnings about what was being planned in Rwanda. Uh, and many actors, including an administration which I was a part of, the Clinton Ford administration, ignored those warnings. It's not the case that you can't see a lot of these things coming. Uh, you know, there's that old uh, course you see on TV where a guy holds up an oil filter, uh, and over his other shoulder is um, an engine seized up engine out of chain. And it's a brand of oil filter. He says, pay me now in 1999, or pay me later. You know? And a lot of preventive diplomacy is very much like that. You know, dealing with pandemics before you go to public health, before they break out. Dealing with the roots of a lot of these uh, problems. And we need much more attention to preventive diplomacy. And thirdly is the great question of leadership. You know, we know what leadership is. Uh, we actually don't see it as often as we'd like in global affairs uh, in terms of leaders. And this is a, not a, this is just a broad commentary. Those that stand out beyond more stops uh, or the border shot. Uh, or frankly, someone who 10 years ago today was assassinated. Yitzhak uh, Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, who had been the Minister of Defense and had been in general and who fundamentally understood the importance of military power, but came to see that you also needed diplomacy. Uh, he often said that he knew that, it, that there was no guarantee for Israel that peace would bring security. But he really realized that security could not be had without peace. And he paid the ultimate price for that. Uh, but I think ultimately we need leaders like Prime Minister Rabin uh, and others for this. For those of us, um, in the academic world, we bridge to the policy world, I think those of us who are students. Let me just conclude on a message that's really there for all of us uh, uh, who need to be policy engaged uh, in our own work and for our students and whatever else we may contribute. And it comes actually from Václav Havel, uh, who was the Czechoslovak playwright dissident, uh, kept in prison for many years, noted intellectual, uh, became the first president uh, after the end of communism of Czechoslovakia uh, and then of the Czech Republic. And in a speech in 1990 to a joint session of the United States Congress, he said, and I quote, I am not the first, nor will I be the last intellectual to do this. 
On the contrary, my feeling is that there will be more and more of them all the time. It's the, it, if the hope of the world lies in human consciousness, then it is obvious that intellectuals cannot go on forever, avoiding their share of responsibility for the world, and hiding their distaste for politics under an alleged need to be independent. It is easy to have independence in your program, and then leave others to carry that program out. But if everyone thought that way, pretty soon no one would be independent. Now, none of us is likely to have the role or responsibilities that Hobble had. But I think we too are intellectuals who must think deeply about what our roles are to be <laughs> amidst these extraordinary times. Thank you. 
decently governed, and we can then cooperate with them to, to face all threats. So I, I think there, I think your question is very well put that you shouldn't just make this simple equation, but there's a deeper uh, connection. With the country. <coughs> yes. Uh, my question to Dr. Jackson will be smaller. Um, and this idea of human security, uh, you mentioned some rubrics uh, being slaughtered, uh, what constitutes human security, but how, what, can you comment, and Dr. Jackson mentioned this as well, can you comment on um, navigating the idea of human political rights in that? I think of Haiti, Somalia, as well as allies of ours that are very authoritarian regime and provided people with a very high standard of living. How do you balance that? It's a really good question because when you have a concept like that, it starts to mean everything. Then it's not very useful for policy terms. And one of the arguments is that well, let's just stick to states because we kind of know what that is, but you can't for all the reasons that I think Henry's response to that last question was extremely important with respect. You know. Uh, in the latest spate of articles on avian flu, uh, and I was worried when we get some of the 24 7 attention for like eight days and it goes away, please don't first off. But one of the points that was made, for example, in the 7.1 billion that was proposed the other day, only 250 million was dedicated to helping states around the world increase their capacity. And sometimes it's not that they uh, mean malice. But if they don't have the surveillance capacity, if they don't have the information capacity, then that means that our ability to deal with it, even if we look at it perfectly selfishly, is going to be defeated. So this notion that you have to help states become capable, that we face right now in some ways the problems of weakness, not just strength on a lot of these issues. There are other issues in which the strength is. On your question, Joe, I think that, I mean, the Libya example is a good one, for example. You know, um, right now there's a case in Libya where there's a show trial of some Bulgarian nurses uh, who were accused of spreading AIDS. They actually came to Libya to help work in the hospitals. And it's another way that this regime uh, you know, tries to sort of find scapegoats for its own problems. And many human rights groups continue to pressure and say, just because Libya you know, did the strategic things, we can't forget about these other issues. And that's right. The, the argument, though, I think, was, you know, did that have to all be a package? You know, and if he doesn't do everything at once, uh, you know, we weren't going to lift the sanctions, we weren't going to make a deal, or you keep pressuring them. I think this was the right kind of sequence. Because the, the problem is, and there's no perfect answer here, if we make the perfect the enemy of the good, you know, I often think of ethnic conflict. And if we were to do better in this decade than in the 90s with ethnic cleansing and genocides by 20% or 25% in terms of the number of killings, you know, I'd never say that's great. But that would be pretty good because sometimes people say, well, if you don't intervene everywhere, you, you know, where are you going to choose? And so I think some of the rights issues, I think one looks at what are the fundamental rights, and if you take it too far, then you try to do too much and you get fewer results. There's a couple of um, themes in your comments that I think start to develop a natural question. I read a couple of books this year, one, Ghost Wars, which was about the history of the CIA covert action in Afghanistan, um, which painted a fairly compelling case that you know we, we had many preemptive opportunities with Osama bin Laden, and several that were almost no brainers to be you know given the details of. But it, then I balanced that with another book, Soft Power, which is you know very um, I think similar to some of the comments you're making about uh, you know, economic development, diplomacy. So I asked an interesting question. You know, we talked a little bit about um, the need for new forces based on the readiness perspective in the rapid response forces, which are new and special forces. This is what we're talking about. We also talk about police state forces. So the need for new types of forces, which really goes towards, I think, the opportunities we have on the covert level to take advantage of some of these human security issues. Um, it's not like being preempted towards a state now. It's being preempted towards a terrorist. If we know somebody is affiliated with a terrorist network, we can go in and take them out for the public. So I'm wondering, is there a tension developing between the idea of soft power, the notion of diplomacy, um, you know, economic development, and the idea that we're going to have probably increasing reliance on covert action? And, and 
I don't know what happens in covert action necessarily, but you know we can understand that if it's covert, there's a greater likelihood that rules are going to be broken, um, rules are going to be changed. Uh, you know, if you read stories about uh, you know, secret prisons where we're interrogating people over the world, we don't know about that stuff. So I just I'd like you guys to comment on: Is there a tension developing between the need for new types of forces that are leading towards special forces covert and this idea of diplomacy uh, and economic development at state level? <laughs> yeah, if I, if I answer the question, I've got to shoot you afterwards. <laughs> this, this is a, a difficult area, which is what is the best tool that one can bring against terrorism? I think we first of all got to understand that the moniker of the war against terrorism is not really accurate. Terrorism is a tactic used by people. And we started to see a movement away from that in a designation that we are in a global struggle against fanatical Islam. I don't think that will last simply because when you look at the authority that's being claimed to use force to interdict and to prevent terrorist acts, it all flows from the President's Commander-in-Chief Authority under Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution. So the President is arguing and will continue to argue that this is a war in every real sense, just like traditional armed conflict, because that's where all the authority is coming. I think most of us that have really tried to study the concept of terrorism, though, will suggest that you cannot be terrorism by military force alone. That is an impossible task. And it goes to a lot of the things that Anne-Marie and Bruce have already suggested, that you have got to look at the root causes of the uh, unrest that is producing the type of dialogue in the mosques. Now, Britain is obviously taking a step in this direction. They've got a little bit more flexibility over what they can do in their country than we do under the United States Constitution. But if we believe that we can rely simply on covert activity, whether it be special forces or CIA operatives working in that area, to defeat those that will use terrorism, we will never win. And that's why I think many can see that the war on terrorism, as we call it, will go on forever. As long as there is any terrorist cell anywhere in the world that can target this country, then we are always at risk. I think we've got to understand that we are an international community, and part of that international community, and the solution to this very difficult problem will only lie in the cooperative efforts, diplomacy, um, the work to work with people in the world, particularly the use of moderate Muslims to try to bring some sort of reason to the debate within that community. Uh, but if, in fact, we believe that military force alone, whether it be major armies or lethal force by a very small covert force, uh, I think we will fail. I think we will fail in my I, I want to answer your question by adding another element that you mix, and I will uh, connect that to, to comment on, on the previous question. One very important unused tool here is going to be much greater individual accountability. So uh, Scott talked about the fact that Milosevic is actually standing uh, in the dock, which is a world historic event. I, it, it, I always say when I was in law school in 1985, there was no such thing as international criminal law. It just didn't exist. I mean, you could talk about Nuremberg, and essentially that was uh, you know, a principle that had been established, and even then we talked about victor's justice, et cetera. But today, many of my former law students are actively working at an international tribunal dedicated to bringing government officials responsible for horrific crimes to justice. Interestingly, although we don't hear about it in this country because we have an allergy to the International Criminal Court. In other countries, what you're hearing from the prosecutor are many government officials who are very aware suddenly that they just might be prosecuted. 
individually for what they've done. So in Latin America, uh, government, uh, army officials saying that all of a sudden the rules are changing because their generals are worried that they just might be prosecuted. In countries that are very sure they're never going to be prosecuted domestically, all of a sudden they realize, oh, that might just be prosecuted internationally, and those are courts that actually work. This connects to your point about special forces, because I think we're, the, 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 one of the implications of moving to a world in which you think about human security, individual security, is you also think about individual government accountability. And you recognize that often the problem is not attacking the entire government. The problem is removing a few individuals who are sufficiently brutal and sufficiently ruthless that as long as they're in play, you're the, the country is how. If we could have indicted Saddam Hussein for crimes against humanity after he gassed the Kurds, and if you had actually had a way of providing that if somebody had just gotten him across a border, he could have been taken to the Hague, things could have looked very different in Iraq, right? You wouldn't have had to send in a whole army. You would have actually had the machinery to, to empower those domestically who want this guy out. And you can replicate that across the, uh, around the world. So one of the things I think we're going to need forces for is exactly to be able to uh, if actually apprehend individuals or put them on notice that there's real danger, that the world is watching, and that they, they cannot commit crimes with impunity. That's a large part of preventive strategy. Second point, just on your point about human security generally. I know whenever I talk about this that at least half my audience is thinking, oh, oh my god, it's clear she's in the Woodrow Wilson School. This is an agenda big enough for uh, Woodrow Wilson himself. We can't possibly do this. We can't possibly take on all of human security as well as state security. I think the answer to that is it's not just us. We have to think about this not in terms of what the US does, but what would it mean to have the world focused on these issues? The European Union is very good at human security in the past the bill. They've put as much money into that as the United States has put into the use of force. Japan as well. Other regional powers that are rising, they have the ability to address a lot of these issues in terms of capacity building. And I would tie capacity building to democracy. Now, that's what the EU has done. Not you have to be a mature liberal democracy, but you have to be trying to make efforts toward the rule of law. You have to, to be actually good governance, transparent governance. If you think about it collectively, where we are actually working with other countries rather than leading against them, then all of a sudden addressing human security and state security together, I think, seems to be good. Let me just jump in on that too, Brandon. Uh, and um, I think that was can't see the side of the room. Um, you know, and let me, let me say something by um, doing a major crossover here, quoting from Oliver North, <laughs> in which he said during his famous testimony, he said, there are bad guys out there. And our bad guys may not always be the same, but he's right about that in a certain sense. People often said, you know, there's a linkage between terrorism and 9-11 and, and the Israeli and Palestinian peace talks. And I remember being asked the question a couple times, you know, um, what's the linkage? Well, you know, if President Clinton's, you know, Camp David initiative had led in 2000 to a full settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian issue, 9-11 still would have happened. Because the people behind that were not about the terms of a deal, no matter what their rhetoric says. They didn't want any deal at all. Okay? So there are bad guys out there, and there are elements that we've all tried to say, which are going to continue to need to use highly coercive strategies, covert action, military force, whatever it is. And that's the way the world is and will continue to be. At the same time, two caveats on that. One, I think, is one that Scott is very passionate about. And, you know, he's it's, it's been, you know, re-injected by this latest story by Dana Priest about, the, about the, the, you know, the secret sites, is that the Geneva Conventions are there not so that we're kind of nice and put kick gloves on, but to protect ourselves. Okay, there's another op-ed in the New York Times today by the guy that ran the CIA operations in Afghanistan where he says, you know, there are two sides to this, folks. And we can get our job done within the Geneva Convention. I did it as the head of the CIA. And that's why the military right now is very passionate about that. So this notion of, you know, we, we have to be, you know, careful about that for interest reasons, not just good guys. Secondly, and I will say something about Iraq here, you know, in Iraq, in the war part, the March, to whatever, um, April-ish part, 
We actually saw what our military can do. Okay, we have the strongest, the best military in the world. Right? And you give them a mission, and they will carry it out in military terms. They will achieve military objectives. Uh, given that, given that we had such an enormous military victory, it actually makes this such a profound message about the limits of that. Because if you win the war and you don't win the peace, you end up, you know, losing what you may have won by winning the war. So that kind of gets to, you know, one of the best, there's no diagram, but when people do this diagram about terrorism, they have sort of three concentric circles. And in the middle are the Ali North type bad guys. And you're going to continue to need to use strategies there uh, that are largely coercive. Uh, uh, but, but also even there, just one other point on that, I remember being at a conference in Germany in February of three on the eve of the uh, Iraq war. And, um, I was having a beer one night with a guy who was an American Air Force officer in NATO base in Germany. And, you know, I was outside the conference, had good conversations, and uh, we talked a little ACC basketball, broke the ice a little bit. And, and then he said to me, he says, you know, I'm a military man, I'm not going to take a position on Iraq. He says, but what I really worry about is the controversy splitting the alliance. We'll get in the way of the things that are really working that you guys never read about. You know, intelligence sharing, border security. And so, there's, you know, it's, it's those are really important issues about how you use the force. So you've got that one circle. The second circle is the people around it who are supporters, whether they're states or other groups, need strategies there too that sometimes are coercive. And then that third circle is the one where we talk about the battle of ideas. They're the, sort of the sympathizers, the people. And there, I think the challenges are tremendous. Because frankly, you know, the notion that um, whether we agree with it or disagree with it, there is a large part of the world that questions you know, our credibility these days. Uh, when Colin Powell went to the UN afterwards, I think it was Figure Brzezinski said, he made the point when Adlai Stevenson went to the UN in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, nobody questioned his sources. It was enough that the American ambassador said, we have evidence that the Soviets are doing this and the world is still not. We are not in that position today and, and, and that is a big problem for us in terms of this broader effort in the context of the world. It's a brief comment following up on what Bruce said. If, if you were to have the uniformed military of the Army of the United States here this morning, they would tell you that with regard to the Dana Priest article about ghost sites or prisons abroad or the application of Geneva Conventions, that we are a nation under the rule of law and they are proud of it. The official Department of Defense policy is that regardless of how you, you designate an armed conflict, we will apply the rule of law. Our guest speaker this afternoon, Colin Powell, when he was Secretary of State, went into the Oval Office and argued with the President of the United States that the Geneva Convention should be fully applicable in Iraq. And just as we had done in 1991, we should apply Article 5 tribunals to determine POW status or not. And he lost the argument. But the United States military believed that some of the covert actions being taken by other government agencies are anathema because it will, as Bruce said, come back to put our own folks in jeopardy. The sons and daughters that you might know that one day will become part of our forces, and that is a tremendous risk. But could I follow up on could I follow up on that? If that's the case, then why were there not any resignations uh, from the armed uh, forces, from the military? Why has nothing been done to stop any of that? If, you, if that's actually true, then all these men who would come here in uniform are cowards, moral cowards, because they are not willing to put their own careers on the line for what they supposedly believe in. Let me just suggest that the answer to that is a legalistic one. A military officer cannot resign in protest, period. He works for the sovereign. And when, after the discussion, after the decision is made by the civilian leadership, this country is founded upon the civilian leadership over the military. Once the civilian leadership makes a decision, it is the responsibility and legal obligation of the military to carry it out whether they agree with it or not. And they cannot resign. Any other Yeah, question for Professor Jefferson. You, you talked about That's comforting. two paradigms, the Libya one, where we were able to get policy change without uh, regime change through diplomacy, and the Iraq paradigm where we got regime change and uh, 
you know, diplomacy and uh, using military force. I just would like to see if you could make a comment about the looming crisis with Iran, and maybe Syria. Uh, the question, if people could hear it, was if I can interpret it, thinking about Iran, uh, does the Libya, what are the lessons of Libya and, and, and Iraq? Um, you know, and here the caveat is there's never, no two, you know, when you study cases, you try to get lessons, then you have to make them fit the other realities. I think in the Iran case, um, a couple of things. One is since um, over the last three or four years, uh, there has been no way, strong solidarity between the United States and the Europeans on this. Uh, which wasn't always the case. And the EU had been taking the lead uh, in these negotiations, uh, making it clear that there really is a strong linkage between economic relationships uh, and the nuclear uh, Secondly, um, I know uh, uh, that um, the military option, uh, it's easy to talk about. But, you know, this is not Iraq, post-Iraq, 1981, where whether you agree or disagree, the Israelis knew the one target that was there, that was part of the nuclear complex, they could take it out. It's much more complicated, things are secret, things are, things are highly hardened and, and the like. So, Atlantic Magazine ran a war game scenario on this in North Korea uh, recently. They also ran a wonderful article there, where Les Gelbro on the war capital issue, the most recent edition. And they really looked at it, and you can see what how limited the options are. Uh, at the same time, one of the lessons of Libya, though, is if you don't have pressures internally on governments to make the change. In the Libyan case, Gaddafi, you know, through his mismanagement of the economy, despite the recent oil boom, had run out of resources in order to keep himself in power. His goals had never changed. They, made, they, they, they remained staying in power, and now he needed engagement, you know, as part of globalization rather than sort of the leader of the pact of the ideological movement against the West. So it, and in Iran, I think, especially with this most recent election, uh, you know, it's, we're facing a regime now that is very, even in an Iranian context, extremely ideological. Uh, the new president is surrounding himself with people who can't get through his own parliament because they're incredibly inexperienced in some key ministries. Uh, that tends to be people who, you know, don't understand sort of all the dynamics of when they're just sort of, you know, taking positions and, and speaking to the crowd. And then Frank made a statement last week about wiping Israel off the face of the earth. You know, we're, we're really anathema. And I, and I think that this the international community responded pretty well. You know, it didn't fly, you know, the United Nations. Uh, and, and the United States and our allies took a firm position. And so his dilemma right now is in Iran, I think, yes, when I've seen it, you have about 20 plus percent unemployment among young males. Uh, and you have other pressures among different groups, including women in society. You know, they want to have, you know, more rights. And uh, the hope there is that the pressures from those elements within society will create some incentives for the government to make a deal. The crucial thing to me is that the international community stays together. That also means, frankly, in the first Bush administration, that, that is the first term of George W. Bush, um, again, I know from sources uh, who've been involved in this, that every time sort of the Europeans would get tougher, uh, the Bush administration said, well, that's great, but now we're moving to the goal line here. You're not tough enough. It's getting very frustrating for the Israelis, frankly, as well as for the Europeans. I think under Secretary of State Wright, it's, it's been much more pragmatic. Uh, and so I think hanging together means the Europeans have to be serious about the linkage. Uh, and we ultimately probably will have to be part of the deal because the last part of that is what Iran probably needs in the United States is security reassurance. That while we'll continue to believe in democracy and support human rights groups, that we are not pursuing regime change. And we are the only ones that can give that. And that's what we gave to Libya. Uh, and given the history we have with Iran, you know, we, you know, again, from their perspective, coup 1953, other things, you know, you can see a reason why people would, would want that to be part of that. So it's gotten harder over the last couple of months, but there's still a uh, possibility. Um, so, uh, I think that much of this has had talked about unilateralism and multilateralism, and obviously the Korean War kind of being the attitude towards the uh, UN question of Guantanamo prisoners uh, on international tribunals, et cetera. There's a lot of sentiment in favor of pursuing unilateral uh, policy. What I'd like to ask you to talk about is where the counter strategy is or the counterweight is in contemporary politics. Obviously, the McCain Amendment on uh, 
uh, how we're going to deal with prisoners of war in this was not. But are there possibilities out there? Do you see them in the State Department in crisis positions, et cetera, uh, where on a bipartisan level you can get a group of people who would have on foreign policy issues the same kind of effort to weigh in as the group of 14 tried to do on the filibuster issues in the Supreme Court? And what is the possibility of our generating a powerful force within our domestic political discussion that would move in the direction of this kind of uh, uh, looking toward multilateral uh, commitments? I'm going to watch it. Just a couple really quick points. One, I think, for Democrats in particular, you know, in the Cold War, the three words that politicians fear the most were soft on communism, and today it's soft on terrorism. And I think the Democrats, particularly in Congress, still, you know, feel constrained, you know, by that. Uh, it's not that they should be soft, but I think that, 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 that the, you know, they're not being um, stunting their thing. Secondly, I continue to believe that the reason that John Kerry lost was because people knew what he was against and not what he was for. And the great challenge is what you're talking about is Democrats have to be able on the foreign policy side not to have a long list of issues. 25 issues here, so one paragraph in each. But frankly, what academics call paradigm and communicators call a frame. You know, a set of core ideas about how we see the world, how power works, what our interests are, how to do things. And, and we re referenced our, our blog that we've been doing with a small group. And we actually have been trying, I think, and then some other efforts as people who have some association with the Democratic side of the street to say, okay, you know, let's really try to define what it is we're for. What is, the neoconservatives did that extremely well, frankly. Uh, and, and that needs to be done. And until that's done, I think the negatives about Bush will not be sufficient for the Democrats, you know, to, to really be looked to on the foreign policy side as a, as a part of the people trust. As long as we continue to, to characterize the conflict as a war, that historically there has been traditional deference by both the Congress and the courts, the President of the United States Command Chief, and that's what's happening. Now you're starting to see the courts probe the scope of that deference, notably Supreme Court decisions of you know, June of 2004. You're starting to see it happen on, on the Hill with McCain Amendment, but you have Cheney Amendment, McCain Amendment, and when I left Washington yesterday, I was told it was pulled. The bill was pulled. So we, we don't know what's going to happen with that. But again, the concept of the nation is at war is a powerful one in the hands of the President of the United States to keep both Congress and the courts at bay. Until there is some clarification of what this is that we're dealing with, I think that, that deference is going to continue. Let me add my two cents, and I think uh, I our moderator will tell us we're out of time. I think for the reason Scott said, uh, because of uh, the fact that we're at war and because we're in an unbelievably polarized political environment, the leadership right now has to come, is coming from, and has to come from moderate Republicans and the military. I was on Capitol Hill last night, and one of the things I heard uh, from a Democratic staffer was that the uh, McCain-Graham group was, we're basically telling the Democrats to lay low, for God's sake, because if you get out front, this is going to become us against them, and we will lose something we are all fighting for. So there's the polarization side of it. Uh, there is also exactly the people who have the most credibility here are our military. And in response to the question about resignations, I accept Scott's point, but I would, I would point out that some of the most effective leaders on McCain Graham have been retired military, Colin Powell himself, uh, and there, there's a wonderful letter signed by every retired military officer you can think of at high levels saying this is just not acceptable, not just the lawyers, but, but the actual military. Uh, and we, there has to be more, more of that. But I think there's a deeper issue that goes to the Democrats and, frankly, the moderate Republicans itself, which is we have got to reclaim the language of patriotism and the values of this country in, in a way that says it is not unpatriotic to question what the government is doing. Furthermore, there are values that are greater than safety. When there's a challenge, the government comes back and says, you're affecting our ability to protect Americans. And my response is, I thought being an American meant there were values that were more important than life itself. I thought, give me liberty or give me death. I thought this was a country about values first. 
And it is absolutely the soul of what patriotism means to stand up and to insist that we're going to fight a war, we're going to fight it consistent with our values, we're going to have real oversight of the executive, we're going to actually stand up and reclaim what we're about from what I think is a false patriotism.